Stephanie mentioned, my name is Morgan. Um, I lead an emerging technology team at Autodesk that focuses on applying rapidly accelerating technologies like machine learning, virtual reality, um, to challenges in the manufacturing industry. Um, and recently, we started working really closely with the Generative Design product group as we decided to um, take Project Dreamcatcher, um, the many years of research we've done in it, and turn it into a soon-to-be commercial product. Um, and you know, I was thinking about you know what what can I talk about with you guys for 15 minutes? Um, you know, up here about generative design. There's so many things, and um, the thing is, as I looked at the way we talk about generative design, um, what I saw uh, from afar six months ago was kind of just images like this. You know, these crazy wild creations um, that the algorithms were coming up with based on design requirements that were process driven. Um, topics like things like designing for additive. Um, but I feel like there was one piece of the story that we weren't talking a lot about, um, which is what is it like to actually work with these tools? Um, what is it like from the human's perspective uh, to actually design for these things? Because um, all we talk about is the technology. And so I wanted to share with you guys um, our first experience actually working with a general design tool, um, going through an actual workflow, what that's like, um, some of the research that we've spun up because of that, and um, kind of share with you and maybe uh, calm any maybe perception you might have that you know, the machine is going to be designing the products of the future. I think um, it's really a, a collaborative partnership. Um, so the way that I think about this is um, sort of the model for engagement between the human and the computer. So you have um, a human who is an engineer. She is under the classic pressures of needing to innovate faster with minimal resources. Um, there's a computer that has access to a large database of material information and manufacturing information, has access to our simulation tools. And these two now need to work together on the same design problem. They're on the same team. Um, but they speak different languages. And so they kind of have to have some sort of framework for engaging with each other. Um, so the generative team kind of created these three working environments, which is define, generate, and explore. Define is, of course, where you define the problem. This is, you know, the, the engineer, she's been told, okay, this computer is now working with you, so she has to now explain the design problem to the computer, the goals, the constraints. Um, and then the generate phase is where the computer takes a look at what she said in define and works through that options from a number of different angles. Um, and then explore is where the computer shows the engineer her, the options that it came up with, and she takes a look and understands, you know, what are, what are the trade-offs here, um, what are the different ways in which you can approach this problem. And this is not sort of a one-and-done thing. This is a very iterative process that you go through. And so when we saw this and kind of got this framework, we're like, okay, great, let's put it to work. So um, we are working on a project um, down at Pier 9. I'm based out of San Francisco's Pier 9 facility, um, and we have this amazing workshop there, and um, we're installing a sensor system on the bridge above the CNC shop. Um, that's for a smart infrastructure project. I'll save the details for another time. But we're putting this wire channel across the bridge and need to um, attach that with some brackets. And the load on the brackets is pretty light, so it's not like some sort of hard optimization problem. But um, we really wanted to explore lots of different material options and manufacturing processes in order to actually go through this process. So we are ready to get started, went into define. And define looks like this. Um, so you have uh, an environment in which you tell the computer what your design space looks like. And so you have um, sort of these anchors of geometry. So the green is what's keep in geometry, and this is where you put your forces and constraints. Um, the red is um, your like no-fly zone. It's, it's keep out geometry. It's where other parts are going. Um, you give it some objectives, um, things you are interested in exploring, what materials and manufacturing processes, and then you hit that big generate button, and then it kind of feels like this. It's sort of this waiting game. You've gave the computer a task, and you kind of have to wait for it to come back and give you some results. But what's going on from the computer's perspective is this sort of orchestration that happens, where it takes your problem and it kind of divides up the work. So it's like, okay, you go look at steel, you go look at aluminum, you go look at you know, designing for additive, and then it comes back, and in Explore, it shows you some of the things it came up with. And so this is sort of the Explore stage, and it gives you some tools to help you actually see its thought process and getting to a particular solution. Um, so this was really exciting for us to kind of see all the different results it was coming up with, but after spending some time in it, we kind of were like, well, a lot of them look the same. Um, we were kind of expecting it to be, you know, lots of different types of shapes and, and maybe some lattices, and um, we realized we didn't even tell the computer that's what we were interested in. So the reality is, like, you know, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna be able to tell the computer something and it's gonna immediately know the solution. So we jumped back in Define and then looked at a number of different ways to tell the computer things we're interested in. So one of the things you can do is use um, a starting shape, C geometry. So we went into Fusion, um, created our own little 
lattice structure and gave it something and kind of said, here, start with this and see where it goes, added some forces for stability, um, and then went back into explore. And this is really interesting. I really like the stress visual visualization that they built out um, where it actually, you can kind of see the computer think through the problem where it um, you know, is adding material in high stress areas and removing material in low stress areas. And you can kind of see how it converges to a solution. But these results were super different. Um, which was really cool, and it's, it's kind of addicting. You kind of like realize that if you give the computer different angles in which to frame the problem, it comes up with different results. So we ended up having over a thousand different options. And the reality is that the, most of those options were terrible. Um, but when you have this new technology, new problems are introduced where now we have a thousand options to have to, have to sort through. Um, so because of our sort of knowledge in machine learning and new interfaces, we thought, you know, what can we do to make this experience a little easier? Um, and this isn't a new problem. This is a big problem in the information age, having to sort through thousands of options. You see it with Spotify or Netflix. You know, they have to come up with these algorithms to kind of make sense of the options for you. And, and some of that comes down to being able to understand similarity. And so um, what we wanted to do is to develop a, a network that could understand similarity. Um, you know, when a human looks at this image, it's pretty obvious to you which ones are similar and which ones are different, but not to a computer. It doesn't know. So we had to train it to understand this part is similar to this part. So that way we could go in and say, you know, computer, I really like what's going on right here. I love, you know, this is really cool too. I'm not into that bulkiness up there. Um, I don't know what happened here. It's probably a viable solution, but I don't want to manufacture something like that. Um, and then hit search and have it come up with something. Um, so that was kind of our goal. Um, and then the other thing we thought about was, you know, virtual reality is a really awesome way to explore things spatially, too. So you could go into a tool and pick up things and, and examine things. You can kind of make a yes, maybe a no pile. Um, and so we built um, an environment like that. So um, this is uh, an experience we have. So this is a monitor, dance, monitor stand data set where you can go in and actually take a look at different um, data sets that it was outputting and examine them next to each other, and then actually tell the system, you know, I really like what's going on here, I don't like what's going on here, highlight something green or red, um, and then hit, you know, show me more, and it brings in things that are more similar to that. So basically what it's doing on the back end is it gets that result and it goes and finds all the pile of, you know, thousands of results and brings you back things that it thinks you're interested in. And then all the way, it's also documenting your sort of decision-making path through this. Um, so this is actually being demoed out in the Idea Exchange if anyone wants to go check it out afterwards. So we um, then, the other big decision-making part for us was we really needed to understand what it was gonna be like in context of where it was going. So we just threw it into um, our Pier 9 space, um, and you could go in in VR and actually walk on the bridge and take a look at what the brackets look like on the bridge or below it, um, because it was in this really high visibility area of Pier 9, we wanted to, the aesthetics were actually an important consideration, which is, I guess, rare for a bracket, but, um, you know, important for our decision-making process. So. The reality is um, define, generate, and explore are areas that like, are building out for every single particular problem, and every design process is different. So explore was the area that we really invested in. But for other problems, it might be something different. Like define was really easy for us. It's so straightforward. It's a bracket. But defining your problem might be really complex for another situation. So while we were working on this project, um, some of our colleagues were working with a company called Anybody. And Anybody is a simulation um, tool for simulating humans and extracting all the information about all the physical behavior that happens when they're in a particular environment. So what they did is actually use the human as input to the algorithm for a particular model. So what they did is kind of simulated all these different scenarios for a particular, so this is a bike example. Um, where they have, um, you know, they looked at braking and sprinting, and what it does is it makes you think differently maybe about like biases you had around designing a bike or designing, you know, something. They might simulate a child and an adult. Maybe, maybe the human is actually something that's a part of the explore stage and the decision-making stage. You maybe try to get a human to assemble something. And so all these tools are, are kind of being built out in this define, generate, and explore. So this is a, like a really nice framework to thinking about how this collaboration happens. Um, so define, generate, and explore are also connected. So because of this iteration is happening, eventually the tool will start to get better at understanding what you're selecting and explore and then feed that to define. Um, 
you know, today I talked a lot about define and explore because that's the user's perspective of things. My colleagues on the engineering team in generative spend a lot of time in generate because that's what the machine is doing. But as we move and build out this ecosystem, the machine will probably help with define as well. It'll understand the problem that you're working on and look at, oh, it's a mechanical system. Oh, it's a factory layout and design the experience and cater it for that particular pro problem. Um, you know, in explore, it'll maybe make recommendations um, for you. Um, maybe the human is, comes up with an algorithm for themselves and says, you know, I actually have an idea. Computer, you go work on this and let's compare notes afterwards. Um, so there's no reason it can kind of not be built out in this sort of way. Um, so the human, of course, is then connected to all these other people, and the, the computer um, might be connected to internal databases. And so there's this whole ecosystem that's iterative and interesting and creative. Um, and so, you know, I think that thinking about how we use generative design, um, the role of the designer will change. Um, but they will still be in this creative process quite a bit, right? Um, I mean, if you think about it, the role of the designer ends up being sort of this in between of being like both a master and a student, um, where they're a master and the, the computer's a, a servant, where you know, the, the uh, designer's always telling the computer what to do, and the computer does exactly that, even if it's not you know, what they expected it would do, but it does exactly what you know, the designer said. And, but, it's, but, but it's also a student, and the computer's a coach, because it might you know, show her you know, things she might not have thought of before, um, give her different perspectives, provide a, a framework for making decisions. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to lend that perspective on um, kind of the future of generative and where we're going and how we are thinking about it at Autodesk. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs>